sure your cinch is tight. Horses kind of snuffy, cold chill up your spine. It'll get your ass moving some more burn on daylight. Kenley and we're burning daylight. Welcome to Burning Daylight, the only podcast for the working cowboy. ahead um well howdy there daylight burners uh hope everybody's had a good weekend and uh i'm i'm excited about this this show uh we've got mackenzie johnston you're we're at nebraska i know sand hill somewhere but whereabouts yeah central nebraska so our ranch lies about a an hour north of broken bow um we're an hour south of ainsworth literally right on the eastern edge of the sand hills we aren't that okay. far from, aren't that far from, from corn country okay okay so that um and, and how long would has your family been in that area well actually we're transplants we've only been here about 20 years before this so my dad started out by alliance nebraska he ranched there with my granddad and then he wanted to expand so he bought a ranch out by harrison nebraska we were on the south dakota nebraska border we were there for about 12 years so we've been he wanted to be back to the sand hills then he moved here to central nebraska okay yeah i got you so uh that's uh that's still a pretty good pretty good chunk of time you guys have been there uh, but i know i know there's a lot of uh a lot of people in nebraska that have been there since you know 18 1850s or whatever so there's yeah some, there's some well-established uh operations in that part of the world oh definitely yeah there's there's some big operations that have been here they've been homesteaded you know 20 years it's quite a while but we're still considered the newbies definitely <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um and so how how did you you've um i, I guess to and, and don't take offense you, you've caused a stink in the beef industry over the past couple of years and uh <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind just kind of running us through how how all that worked yeah definitely so um long story short i started working for nebraska cattlemen back in 2014 um and i've always been on our family ranch that's the state that's, yep. That's the State Cattle Association. Yep, it's, a, it's an affiliate of NCBA. So I just always like to have a side gig to get me off the ranch or else I never leave. So anyways, started working for them in 2014. Then in March of 2020, I wrote an article uh, about Brazilian beef imports, uh, uh, opinion editor editorial that Tri-State Livestock News out of Belfouche, South Dakota ran for me. And basically that article called out uh, Sunny Purdue not halting Brazilian beef imports. It puts our cattle industry at risk and all that jazz. So uh, that happened. And then a few weeks later, I was fired from my position with Nebraska Cattlemen. I'd worked for them for six years and I received a two minute phone call being fired. And right about that time was when COVID was hitting and markets were falling out of bed and everything was very uncertain. And I was very frustrated with my situation with Nebraska Cattlemen. So I went ahead and wrote a blog post about how organizations like Nebraska Cattlemen and NCBA, how they do not represent the common cattlemen, the grassroots man that's out here working every day. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of essentially stirred the pot, turned everything upside down. 
And I was the reason I was given was because of that article. Uh, the NCB was just like a guest post for Tri State Lies. Right. right. Yeah, this was just one I sent in that I felt the need to write and um, they they published it for me. Um, they publish a lot of editorials. They do a great job. And yeah, so <clears throat> I was told that that article did not align with NC or NCBA. Uh, but of course, I felt like Brazilian beef imports, they do harm our industry. And they have a they, there's a chance that they could just tear our industry apart if something really terrible would happen. Mad cow disease getting here, something like that. So anyways, that, um, that couldn't have anything to do with, you know, JBS being Brazilian owned or national beef being major, uh, majority Brazilian owned or I, I just don't, I didn't know that cancel culture was a thing on, on the conservative side of the aisle. You're telling me. I mean, uh, who, who would have thunk it? I mean, uh, I don't know. Do, he was, I mean, he was appointed by a Donald Trump, so he's supposed to be a good guy, right? Right, exactly. Oh gosh, it, it's almost like all politicians are pieces of shit. It's, uh, it's, almost, <laughs> it's weird. Oh, I, I totally agree. And like you said, I didn't know cancel culture was even like in our industry, I guess I'd say that much, but they tried their darndest to shut me up. And um, yeah, so you mentioned the Packers, obviously at that time when I was fired, the big four Packers, all four of them, uh, they were all members of NCBA. So uh, I'm sure they had, they had some, something to say about it. And then here recently, uh, NCBA came out and they came out saying that they want to halt all Brazilian beef imports uh, because there were a few, a couple atypical cases of mad cow disease that were reported down in Brazil back in September. And uh, there were a couple cases of Kreitzfeld, I don't think I'm saying that right, Kreitzfeld Jacobs disease, it's the human form of mad cow disease that was reported down there in Brazil. And now they're jumping on the bandwagon, hey, we need to stop the Brazilian beef imports. And so in the past couple weeks, I wrote an article about how it's interesting how now they're like, oh, let's let's run and save the industry. Let's halt the Brazilian beef imports. But a few years ago, if you said anything about Brazilian beef imports and you had anything to do with NCBA, they'll just cut you off, you know, cancel, cancel you essentially, like you said. So yeah, that's that's basically my track record of stirring the pot. I think that's yeah. kind of, that's kind of what I've known for, I'm known for. I always, I don't know, I've always been one to speak up, uh, even if people don't agree, I guess. Um, the people that don't agree with me, that's completely fine. And we can disagree in this industry. That's the thing. That's completely yeah. fine. The, the problem is that we have, when we have disagreements and people are canceled, you know, I see that in other organizations, not just NCBA. So that's kind of my track record. Yeah. Well, it's um, like, like you said, six years of employment. And, and uh and, and that generated a, a two to three minute phone call that said hey get out that's yeah. uh that's that's pretty remarkable i've uh <laughs> i i, I kind of had a it, it's funny when when you start to speak up and it, and it goes against like the like the mainstream for the lack of a better word like the mainstream narrative or agenda mm -hmm. uh, yeah people don't like that i i've i've, I've experienced that when 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 you when you voice an opinion even if it's unpopular um yeah there's certain people and uh, and especially in places of power they just like they're mm, nope nope yeah exactly you can't go against the grain mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it's wild and you would you would think and i i guess we were, we were talking a little bit before we we came on air here um i i i dipped my toe into this uh this beef cattle industry uh argument back in what was that that had been 2019 when the the fair cattle markets uh campaign which that was the western ag reporter i think i don't know if tri-state uh livestock was involved or not but i know western ag reporter was really the driving force behind it yeah they kicked it off yeah and so you had a lot of like rcaf type folks um you had well just a lot of a lot of different um a lot of different people from all over the industry and I, I if i remember right the the initial push was try to get the attention of donald trump was mm -hmm. through through twitter because twitter was well was trump's uh, main main uh mode of communication 
I would say it ultimately failed, and it, it really just turned in. It would just look like a bunch of monkeys slinging shit back and forth, and uh, and it was just it was not good for for anyone in in the industry. I don't. Packers, Packers benefited. They always do, but mm-hmm. <laughs> the that the actual cattle producer, we we looked we looked childish, and I was I was really really bummed out by that whole deal. And then a- after that, I had uh, I had Bill Bullard on. Um, and then I had John Robinson from NCBA and, and then a couple weeks later I had, uh, Leah Biondo from U.S. Cattlemen's on and man, I just, I, after all of that, I, I just felt exhausted talking to, and, and, and I just, I ride pins for a living. I, I've got a, you know, one guy that, that, that works below me. Uh, and so, so I, I have a very small part of the of the cattle industry, but I just felt I left there like thinking, man, we, we are in a, not in a good spot, not in a good spot. Yeah. And, and uh, oof. yeah. And as we talked about beforehand uh, within the cattle industry, um, what we do best is we circle our wagons and we shoot inward. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we do, we, I'll, I'll say there's, all we have our main organizations we have usca we have ncba we have rcaf there are things i agree with with those organizations and there are things i disagree with um yep you know across the board one thing that we cannot seem to do in our industry is compromise i don't know if that comes from pride if that comes from ego if it comes from just wanting all the credit for fixing the industry. But at the end of the day, I had a conversation with a friend of mine and what we were talking about is it's not going to be an organization that's going to save our industry. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be the government because if it was, they would have stepped in and something would have been done by now. It comes down to individuals in the industry. You know, if we look back Mm -hmm. over the past few months, what cattle feeders have done, the leverage they have gained, the fact that they have put their heels in the ground and they have demanded more money. That is what we have to do. You know, all these new Mm -hmm. packing, all these new packing plants coming online. We've got the one here in North Platte, sustainable beef, you know, getting that's awesome. Home. Yes, it's fantastic. And there's, you know, I can't even name them all off, but that's what we have to do as an industry because mm-hmm. we not rely on the government for anything. And then, no. cattle, and then cattle organizations, I've got nothing against any of them. They're all good, but you know, it's, it's hard. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to get things done. It's hard to get things done when all we do is fight, you know? Mm-hmm. So And I think that's part of the reason why I've been so vocal is that I'll take it upon myself to talk about some issues and whether or not I get anything done, I don't know. But yeah, I see, I've been pounding the table for, um, for direct to consumer beef. Uh, I started this deal two and a half years ago on this podcast and, and very early on, I, I guess that that I see this as a way because the millennials are now the majority of the market share. Uh, or, or the target target market, your consumer is majority m- millennial. Millennials want source and aged verified. They want like humanely raised. All all the the hipster hippy dippy. I I don't want to call it bullshit, but it comes off as bullshit a lot. But it, it's true. We like we we need to and we need to be proud of that we're taking care of our our cattle. We you know all all, all that stuff uh, it makes a difference. But your traditional cattle producer doesn't want to doesn't want to lean into the to the feel good type deal. Well, you can't you can't get by on the romance anymore. It, that, like that, that, that part's over. That's exactly it. And um, I think so many within our industry are so hard headed to make any changes, you know, look outside mm-hmm. the box. And what the consumer wants now is different than what it, the consumers wanted back in 1976. Back in yeah. 1996, you know, things have completely changed. And as an industry, we we do have to pay attention to what the consumer wants, you know, mm-hmm. products, all that jazz. And we have to follow that because they're the ones that are buying our product. We have to be open-minded to change at least. Mm-hmm. Well, and you can also wear your values on your sleeve and, and still get somewhere. I mean, look, look at a, like my water bottle is covered in black rifle coffee st- gear. Yeah. I've been a huge fan of them. They, they're unapologetically pro America, pro Second Amendment, you know all that, and they just got they just went public and valued at one point seven billion dollars. You, 
you can you can wear your values on your sleeve and be successful. Yeah. You, you and nostalgia still sells. You can still capture the the romance of the the cattle industry, and still provide those like, hey, this is humanely raised. This is antibiotic free or whatever the fuck uh, people want to you know want nowadays. Uh, and you can still explain that, hey. This one had antibiotics, but if we didn't give them antibiotics, it would have died, and nobody would have got to, to uh, enjoy this delicious cut of beef. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, we can we can still tell our story, and I think I think we will always uh, be a romanticized industry. And it is, I mean, if you look at what we do day in day out, it's it's mind blowing. The lifestyles we get to live, um, what we do every day, mm-hmm. we will always be a romanticized industry. But um, yeah, we, and like you, you talked about antibiotics, like we need to do a better story, tell, do a better job telling our story, like Mm -hmm. across the board, that's, that's a big issue we have in our industry, the disconnect in between, uh, you know, us and urban America, the consumers, all that we, we need to do a better job. And uh, I think that would help us out. Oh, I I think so too. And uh... Oh, uh, well, we had a we got a couple comments here, but Ag Associ- said uh, Ag associations always start with good intentions, um, just like the government, uh, but they very rarely um, like they they all like any big organization. The bigger they get, the the more bureaucratic they get, uh, the more like infighting, and the more entrenched people get. Because power power is a very addictive thing, and. Yeah. Uh, and even as something as like, you know, the, the local Nebraska cattlemen's, you know, like in the grand scheme of things, a pretty small organization, mm-hmm. but it has a pretty outsized influence in, in national, uh, the national beef conversation because Nebraska, not only do they, a lot of cow calf, yeah. a lot of stalkers and a ton of feedlots. And, and they're, they're one of the last regions that still, there's uh, a good chunk of people that sell fat cattle on the, on the cash market. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of a lot of those like Nebraska, Montana, that that area, a lot of those producers get the shaft the most because they uh, their cattle, their fat cattle are what sets the basis for all the formula pricing. And uh, and these these packers are able to just kind of box them out and give them bare, bare bones. And that that trickles throughout the entire industry. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, as you know, there's been a lot of talk about negotiated, uh, negotiated fat cattle sales versus all the formulas we have in our Mm -hmm. industry and how we tackle that. And there's been legislation introduced and there has been so much controversy over that. um, Right. Just even in the past two weeks with the compromise bill that was introduced and then um, the bill that Ro Khanna and Cory Booker introduced. um, You know, yeah. So let's 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 talk about those because I, I haven't I, I i've been sent some kind of like basic bullet points on them but I, i'm not super familiar but it, it's i know the compromise bills kind of it's not new i mean the the ideas behind it are kind of from what i understand have been floated around for a while now yeah definitely um so <laughs> i don't know all the ins and outs about these bills but i know surface level the gist of them so the compromise bill the compromise bill it's senator grassley fisher wyden and tester and essentially what they did is they threw all their ideas that have that they have come up with over the past year together came up with a bill that um would mandate negotiated cash trade per plant on a regional basis um it would be set over the average of the past 18 months and the USDA would kind of be tied in with that and people hate that. And I kind of understand that USDA, in my opinion, they've not always been the most honest agency. Um, no. Yeah, so there's that bill and um, uh, I'm gonna, this is gonna be super unpopular opinion, but I think that bill, uh, there's not everything in it that we want, but I think it's level-headed and we have an opportunity to pass it. So then on the other hand, we have Cory Booker and Ro Khanna, those gentlemen, both Democrats, uh, that doesn't matter, but I'll touch more on that in a bit. Um, their bill is super aggressive. And yes, we need an aggressive movement in our industry, but we also need to go after something that is attainable or else nothing's gonna happen. So- uh, We got vegan Spartacus on the other one. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He's quite a character. Um, that bill would mandate fifty percent, fifty percent negotiated cash trade across the whole nation, and that in itself, um, 
you know, down there in Texas, I think they only have about 4% negotiated cash trade. That might be kind of low, but you get into some of those Southern states, there's, there's very little negotiated cash trade. And I know mm-hmm. it needs to increase, but not, they're not going to jump up to 50% overnight. Not a, not a chance. No, exactly. And then also um, another part of that bill, uh, the Packers can only own and feed cattle for seven days before slaughter. That's also a stretch. Um, it's, just, it's a super aggressive bill. I'm not saying there's anything bad about it. The thing that gets me though, is that Booker is behind it. And same with Ro Khanna. Ro Khanna, uh, for those of you that don't know, he is a big advocate of the Green New Deal. Yeah. And then Booker, he, he he's a vegan. And I know a lot of people, um, they've messaged me and they say, well, that doesn't matter. Well, what are his att- intentions long-term? You know, he wanted to shut down CAFOs, uh, concentrated. Yeah, completely, by 2030. Yes, exactly. And I agree that there are some situations, these he- massive factory farming ag, you can talk about chickens, you can talk about mm-hmm. cattle. There are some issues, but you don't just shut those down. What are the no, people, and what are, what are people going to eat? You know, right. And like, there's, there's a lot of, there, like, there's a lot of wiggle room we can, we can, uh, we can go through before we, like, I, I always use Southern, Southern Utah, Southern Nevada. Like you can't raise, uh, well, I mean, I guess you can raise grass fed cattle out there, but your herd size is going to shrink by like two thirds. Cause that, there's just not the groceries out there. They're just not the groceries. That's exactly it. And obviously there's nothing in this bill that talks about CAFOs, but my point is you have to look at Booker's track record, just like, just like yep. anything, you know, across the board. And he, so a few other points that I have to make while we're talking about this is he's all about this build back better bill, this trillion dollar mm-hmm. bill, you know, anyone that's for that, you have to question what they're about. You know, there's just, there's so many things in his history that you have to look at to think about what is his long-term goal. And yeah, he wants to do away with KFOs. What does he want to do away with after that? Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think getting in bed with an animal rights, vegan activist, whatever you want to say is the thing mm-hmm. to do in history. Um, well, and, and especially when he's not doing it for um, uh, altruistic method like he he's a vegan from a so-called moral standpoint like it's not a has nothing to do with like a dietary Mm -hmm. need no he he uh he has become well i I called him vegan spartacus you know because he is he is a very um he's an opportunist at at at, you know at every level like he's like he he was one of the guys that was calling biden a racist during the democratic primaries everybody seems to forget about that but uh yeah, he's he is not a good faith actor. Uh, Ro Khanna, I I wouldn't say he's a bad faith actor. I just say his uh, like his ideals are very much at odds with what our our industry is about. I, I don't think he's a bad guy. I I, I I think like a lot of those leftists, their hearts are generally in the right place. They're just they're coming from a way different point of view than we are. Yeah, yeah, and. Um... You know, I, everyone talks about how we need a super tough, aggressive bill. And I agree, but we have to look at what's attainable as an industry. If we do want to get negotiated cash trade increased, if we want to do that through legislation, which I'm not saying that's right or wrong, if we want to do that, though, you have to bite off a little bit at a time. You know, you just can't. Yeah, you, you, yeah sure. I wish I wish we could just dive right in and everything would be hunky dory next week. It's not going to happen that way. And then also, which this is going to sound super negative, but is this legislation going to do anything long term? Are the Packers going to be able to fi- figure out a way around it? See, that was my entire and and I I grilled uh, Bill Bullard on this because I said so with this like Amanda M- uh, M- Cool. That's that's the the big the big point of emphasis for RKF USA is mandatory mandatory country of origin labeling, and I get the idea behind it. I, I I understand it, but I also said if if they implement MCool tomorrow, who is in charge with enforcing it? The USDA, who are you are at in a lawsuit with over the beef checkoff, and you expect the USDA to enforce this deal that 
you uh you know in, you know to for this mandatory country of origin labeling i don't have any faith that the usda is going to be a, a good faith actor in this and yeah. and maybe i'm i'm just way too cynical but i i can also go back and read history and, and see like the, the packers and stockyard act is still in place not enforced it's still in place it's still there um is this what this uh you know like the 50 40 or whatever the the proposal is now is that is it going to be there and not enforced because if if that's the case then we we spent all that political capital for absolutely nothing so yeah. i i just i i think they gotta and you look at the the state of national politics as it is right now what have they accomplished in the well in in the we'll say the nine months of Biden and the four years of Trump, what really got accomplished uh, on, on Capitol Hill? Not much. Two impeachments yeah. and a bunch of bullshit investigations and uh, our taxes got raised huh. uh, and, and we spend more money. Yeah. But what, what actually got accomplished? Not much. Uh -huh. So I think we got to start working at the state level uh, and, yeah. and, and work in there. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Local state, you know, and you gotta, you gotta be willing to take action. Like we were talking about yeah. earlier. I, I think it starts with us in the industry and we, we can't just sit around and wait for an organization or the government to save us. That's part of the problem as a whole, this country, mm -hmm. you know, it's a mentality that the government's going to provide everything. And that's a whole other yeah. avenue to go down, but as an right. industry, we don't want to have that kind of outlook. I think. I don't think so either. I mean, you look at the Prime Act, which should have been a, like a no-brainer to just allow a state a state uh, inspection to be just as good as a as a federal inspection, and they didn't even get a vote on that bill. I know. Like, like I don't even know if it made it out of committee. I don't even know if it made it to committee. I I don't know. And see, the, like my dad and I were talking last night. Like, there's been a. Uh... A buckets full of legislation that has been brought forward let's say in the past two years mm. what has what's been what's been passed nothing right. <laughs> yeah and, and if it does get passed is it going to be enforced that's, yeah, that's yeah. another like, like yeah like you were saying like who who is going to ho hold everyone accountable and make all that happen mm -hmm. yeah and it's just uh well, with any law, like you can put all the laws on the books you want, but if if you can't enforce it, then as you're pissing in the wind, uh, that's 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 all all that is. And um, I, I guess like on another hot button issue is is the the beef checkoff, and I hundred percent understand the 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 thoughts behind it. Is it is simply a tax on on the producer. However, I like should you get the check off repealed is it gonna do much in the long long run of things like i i think that's a i don't know maybe it's a fight worth having just on on principle but i just man i think we spend way too much time on that and yeah, i don't i don't know what what good it does yeah i've been i've been kind of vocal about this issue um i i'm i'm opposed to the check off i think when it was first implemented it did good things but i think um it's gotten too greedy. I mean, they take in mm -hmm. 40 million a year, something right around that. And a good chunk of that goes to our National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And yep. where they where they aren't representing the grassroots cattle producer, I think it'd be good for them to get that money cut away from them, in my opinion. Uh, no, as I whole, agree 100%. Yeah, and we need a marketing um, program. You know, we need the beef checkoff, like the pork guys need the pork checkoff, all that. I, I do think it would be great to reform it. Um, you know, I don't think I don't think it does a terrible lot for cattle producers right now. I'll be honest. Uh, no, no, I don't think it does. But, you know, it kind of, we there was a petition out there to bring about a beef checkoff reform and over the past year and we needed 88,000 signatures and I think maybe there was around 30,000 that were collected and you know it, it's not saying that it's not attainable because I'm not going to be a negative Nancy but that kind of goes back to the USDA it's through the USDA that we have to work mm -hmm. to get this reformed and the USDA they're not straight shooters they no. I, I mean, ever well, see, since I this think. is where we can we can find a lot of common ground with the lefties 
Yeah. We don't like corporations. Neither one of us like these giant corporations. And we shouldn't because they they control federal policy. They control state policy. Uh, hell, they control NCBA, Nebraska Cattlemen's Colorado Livestock. All the, they control policy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and this is, you know, the big, uh, one of the big conservative uh, triumphs at the Supreme Court was the, oh, um, the super PAC, uh, what was <sighs> Citizens United uh, decision where corporations are people, you know, uh, so they can spend unlimited amount of money as long as they don't have direct contact with the, uh, you know, the candidate, you can oh, spend yeah, yeah. millions and millions and millions of dollars in a super PAC. Well, guess who, uh, especially like these rural states, who are the biggest contributors to that? It's the, the meat industry. It is, uh, is like, um, Oh, uh, the ag insurance, um, uh, farm, uh, Bro? Farm, yeah, farm bureau, um, farm bureau, the, the Packers, all, all yeah. these like huge, heavily regulated corporations. Um, they, they got their fingers in all, uh, Monsanto, all, all these, yes. all these big corporate. And, and if like, like I'm, I'm kind of coming around on the GMO stuff. Like, well, I think, don't think there is dangerous as uh, as a lot of people think they are i also don't take anything monsanto says at face value uh they they, they worked actively to uh deny um medical benefits to vietnam vets over agent orange yeah look know. that up oh yeah yeah they uh they tried to claim no fault to it, even though they knew the harmful side effects of Agent Orange. They they tried to claim no fault because they were a government contractor. Oh my god! And yeah, yeah, yeah. Mon- Monsanto, Decalb, all, all the Purdue, um, all all these big ag corporations are uh, have got some really, really, really shady back uh, backstories. So mm-hmm. uh, keep that in mind when when uh, you see some of these, you know, whether, whether it be Farm Bureau or Monsanto or, or any, any of these, uh, Merck, all, all these pharmaceutical companies, we're seeing that now with this, uh, with this, uh, uh, with this pandemic stuff, like the uh, pharmaceutical companies play a huge part in politics. Huge. Yeah. It's all about cashing in. Uh-huh. And, uh, and it, it's no different on the ag side of things either. So like we, we gotta, you gotta stay stay tuned into that 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 narrative too i yeah. always kind of keep your conspiracy hat handy yeah <laughs> mine <never> comes off <laughs> yeah I, I i keep mine in my back pocket just just for <laughs> just for for special occasions you know you never know when you'll when you'll need it but um have you ever read that book called uh i think it's called the meat racket uh, I sure have. About the, um you know when when you when you go through like the origin story of Tyson, like I, I'm a big fan of Tyson when they first started, like like the, how they built into the 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 company they are today is, yes, incredible, sketchy, but like the the origin story is a, I mean that it is like you're rooting for the guy, and for then sure. you start to see how, but if it's like every big company throughout time, like they the they get more bigger, bulkier, and the just the everything becomes less efficient and uh and corrupt exactly yeah i mean they start off on a good note they're honest to start with and then Mm -hmm. i think it's just like you talked about power and then greed just so addictive Mm -hmm. and it gets out of hand and um they don't have a conscious at the end of the day i think when they become these big yeah corporations yeah, because uh, corporations aren't actually people. They're made up of people, yeah. but the the the, in, the entity itself they they are not people. They don't have feelings, emotions. They don't have a conscience. Yeah, and, and you just end end up with a giant good old boys club like it's always been. Like mm-hmm. when you go through that book, like all of, is it a uh, whatever town that is in Arkansas where where Tyson's head is it Benton? I cannot remember. Uh, Fayetteville or some, somewhere somewhere in Arkansas I know that but right. like the entire town is all tied in like the banks the, the construction the trucking everything is tied back to to Tyson mm-hmm. and 
and, and it's, it's it's just a factory town like uh, or you know like this, the the old like mining towns uh, of of old where you had to shop at the company store and then mm -hmm. it's the same thing just uh, with a little different label on it. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, you know it's it's a sad story in the long run, in my opinion. You know mm -hmm. they just get so I think busy. so too. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, and you know there's and that's also something you've got to. Uh, you got to be wary of is uh, getting too much government involvement because if you look at the dairy industry, I don't want to be in in the dairy farmer's shoes right now. I mean, where they have got price floors, but they're they're just dumping tankers of, of milk, and but yet they're still putting in like a lot of these uh, in south southwest Kansas. A lot of these these old closed down feedlots are getting bought up and turned into heifer yards, and you're. Just, how much milk do we need? I don't <laughs> how know. How much milk do we need? <laughs> I don't know. And yeah, like you talk about government involvement. Uh, I feel like the, we as an industry, as a cattle industry, has have we've done a decent job of keeping uh, the government out of our industry. I mean, mm -hmm. it, but it's nothing like you can talk about corn farmers or crop yeah. growers in general. They're completely subsidized. Um, yeah. You know, and we don't want to become that. We don't, we don't no. want that. We want our independence. We want true competition. We don't want the government in everything. And I do understand that, yes, maybe the government can step in and assist, assist us with a few things, but, you know, when does it start and when does it end? And mm. our administration well, right now, I just, I don't know. It's all really worrisome. Well, if you look at just the genetics from the beef industry to the dairy industry that tells you a whole lot about what you get from a subsidized product you can trace every head of holstein in the country back to like three different bulls yeah and uh most seed stock producers have at least three different lines of bulls that they're selling mm -hmm. uh and that's just one seed stock producer so like the 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 competition the variety and, and just the overall health of the herd is is way better in the beef industry and i, and I work with a lot of dairy cattle and yeah they, they're the most inbred like <gasps> i mean i mean they're just they're not good cattle i mean they, they make a lot of milk i guess but as far as a, a cow goes they're just they're not they're not good cattle the yeah they're there's not <clears throat> there's no hardiness to them there's no there's no genetic diversity to them they're all they're cookie cutter yeah, exactly. And that's what has come about from a government mm -hmm. being involved so heavily in yeah. that industry. Yeah, it's uh, like the Jersey breed is kind of almost gone by the wayside because they don't produce the pounds of milk that the Holstein does. And well, when you're you, you get a bare minimum, I mean, like your your price for your product can't drop below a certain level. All you, you're not trying for for any diversity of product. You're just sheer pounds. Same way with the corn farmer. It's just raise that yield, baby. Yeah, exactly. There's just, there's no independence. I feel like there's no pride in the product you produce. Whereas, you know, us in the cattle industry, like we want to buy those, those specific mm -hmm. bulls to get those the best calves, the most pounds, all that. We're all a little different. We're all about stepping up our game and, you know, yeah. rise above and you take that away. And I think things go to hell. I, I think so too. I mean, I, it's uh, the, especially the the farming industry. It's, it's 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 just depressing to watch because it's all it's all subsidized and and everybody bitches about you know four dollar corn. Well, you keep producing more of it. Like there, yeah. the price ain't going up. <laughs> like yeah. you, you kind of got to restrict the supply. I mean, if if you know any basic sort of uh, economics, like if you if you just keep producing more of the same crop and and everybody's doing it uh, that, that yeah you know, there's there's only so much corn you can you know you can consume yeah but and, no matter uh, what they're going to get paid the crop the right. real crop farmers and that's it's gosh it's just a mind blowing uh mm -hmm. system, really yeah yeah it re it really is and i i don't know i mean that's that's one where i think i, I don't i don't know what happens there like i don't know how you fix it it's i really don't I don't think you come back. I mean, I don't, I don't think you turn that train around. It is going hard down the tracks. You, once the government is heavily involved with that, basically when, mm -hmm. I mean, once you're completely vertically integrated, 
you don't change things. I don't think unless like the whole country as a whole would fall apart and everything would be built from the bottom up again, um, which God forbid that yeah. happens. But yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's it's just you know every year it's uh, buy it buy a new John Deere. John yeah. Deere makes makes all that money, and you get you know you got to buy all them John Deere parts and. Oh, yeah. yeah, but it's okay. They'll, they'll send you a free cap every now and then. So that, that, that's <laughs> worth it. Who buys a new John Deere? <laughs> <laughs> what are those like? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know, but it's, uh, yeah. And, and then the, I don't know. It just, it, it's wild. I, I, I don't know. I, I think you're right. I think it comes crashing down at some point and yeah. I don't know. I, I look at my, my home County, and I look at some of the literature that like got people to Bacca County, Colorado, and they they're billing it as like the next um, Willamette Valley, you know, just a farmer's paradise. Well, no, it's part of the region that Zebulon Pike dubbed the Great American Desert. Oh. We we get somewhere between eleven and thirteen inches of rainfall a year, oh my. and it, it's it's not farm country. It never has been, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and it directly led to the Dust Bowl <laughs> by, yeah. by people moving there. Yeah. And, and, but they still try to raise, uh, you know, dryland crops, same mm -hmm. dryland crops they've always, they've always raised. And uh, <sighs> I don't know. I don't, it's just, uh, it's a never ending cycle, it seems like. Yeah, it is. And I don't, I don't know. Um, I think ag is becoming more corporate all the time across the board. We can talk about mm -hmm. every industry. And um, I don't, I mean, for those of us that are still in the industry that are independent, we just have to keep our independence and find a niche market in order to mm -hmm. make the wheels continue to turn. You know, like I was talking about earlier, we have to, as ourselves, uh, we have to be smart businessmen. You know, we have to mm -hmm. be better marketers. Um, the marketing, and, especially like I, I have never seen an industry bitch so much about the the state of the industry and spend so little time marketing their own product. We we have to, yeah, look look for a different route, you know. Um, yeah, you can't do it the way granddad's always done it anymore. That, that's yeah, the thing. exactly. Like, and that that's not saying your granddad was wrong. At yeah, the time, he was probably right. For sure. the, yeah, things exactly. Change. Things have changed. And I mean, there are new ideas out there. Even me as a young mm -hmm. person coming back to our ranch, the new ideas that I want to implement, you know, and maybe there'll be a flop, who knows, but you have to be willing yeah. to cry. You can't continue to do the same thing and not get ahead or T take a risk. Is that what yes. you're saying? Is, are we yeah. going to take a risk? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Don't, don't say risk. That's <laughs> God uh, forbid. <laughs> bubble wrap everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's I, Somebody's I'm, got to put their neck out there. It, yeah, it's, it's, I'm all about risk. I mean, I think that that's just how you get ahead in life. And yeah, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll lose some. You win some, you lose some. But you take enough risk and you got enough drive behind you. I think that's how you make things happen. Yeah, I think so. And when you look at the risk that uh, that people say, well, say they're in your your neck of the woods. Uh, like you're you're basically the like the frontier from uh from omaha west is you know it's wild country and guess what they did they drove cattle out there and they built a ranch and you know what it could one morning they could have a bunch of shoshone just run off all their stock burn burn the house but guess what they did it anyways yeah that's, exactly that's a little more risk than uh you know missing a missing a banker note that's a little more risk yeah i i mean i think about my ancestors you know they they traveled out there to Western Nebraska. Uh, they lived in the side of a hill, a dugout for, for a while, you know, before they got everything homesteaded, the mm -hmm. risk they took it's, you know, I just, and this is another route. I mean, I think we can't be, we can't be comfortable and we can't be lax. You know, we have to be willing to take those risks. We've become such a society of comfort. And I know that's a big conversation, but even in our industry, you know, we, mm -hmm. Take those big risks. I've heard people say negative things about these new processing plants that are coming on. And oh yeah, my biggest thing is yeah, there's a chance they might they might not go over. I don't know, and you don't know. But imagine if they do go over. Think about the right. It's incredible. Yeah. All those people that have invested their money and their time, like 
man, I admire them. It is so awesome. So yeah, I, I, I think it's great. I think it's great. I, and I, I had Trey Wasserberger on to talk about sustainable beef and like, I, and I said at the time, like, I am glad to see somebody stepping out there doing something besides mm -hmm. just bitching and, and besides relying on uh, the three, the three main trade associations or the government, like that, yeah. don't yeah. rely on the government. Like you never can, you never have been able to, why, why do we think we can rely on it now? Yeah, like, that's we, exactly we're, it. What we're, you... we're an industry of, uh, get the hell out of my way. I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And we, but we've turned into a bunch of whiny little bitches too. It, yeah. And it's like, we got to get back to that. Just like, get out of the way. Let me do it. Yeah, exactly. And that's the mentality. And you touched on Trey. He is just uh, a leader in this industry for mm -hmm. a lot of better terms. I mean, he's the kind that he puts his head down and he gets shit done. And um, we need more people like that, I think. And we have to, like you said, we have to be willing to take a risk and possibly mm -hmm. get ahead. Well, it's just, it's like everybody who's ever worked cattle with an older person has had that moment where they go, get the hell out of my way. I'll do it myself. <laughs> yeah. And we, we need people to do that. Like stop, yeah. stop trying to, you know, rely on Jerry Moran or whoever your Senator is, mm -hmm. get the hell out of the way and, and just take charge. Like yeah. just do, do what's right for your, your operation, whether that means, you have to let go your superior rep and because you're you're feeding out your cattle your own this time you know what whatever the case may be like yeah. if it's good yeah. for your industry or your your operation that's what you got to do exactly and until we vote better people in that maybe do represent us our industry better we can't rely on the ones that are in there because like you said mm -hmm. It's, it's just the same, the same story over and over again you know they're not going to step up for us because most of them are paid off so yeah yeah, because um, I don't know if anybody had heard, but there was 80, um, 80 Republicans in the House that voted to uh, implement a uh, vaccine registry, na federal vaccine registry. And there's 80, 80 Republicans that signed on to that, including uh, like uh, Adam Crenshaw, I mean, Dan Crenshaw, Adam Kinzinger, uh, Liz Cheney. Uh, if there, you needed another reason to vote her out, Wyoming. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, all, all those cast of characters <clears throat> supposedly standing up for conservative values just voted to implement a vaccine database, which that should scare the shit out of you for certain. And I hope everyone's aware of who did that and they'd make damn sure they don't get back in because yeah. my gosh, I mean, we can talk about the vaccine mandate and all that. That's scarier than shit. Yeah. Right. And, and that's. And so you have people that have been publicly vocal against vaccine mandates that just voted, basically voted in favor of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Don't trust your politicians. <laughs> yeah, Don't. exactly. I feel like there's only been a handful that we could trust in, in history. Yeah. So. yeah, there's just been a very few, very few. Um, but... I, uh, I'd like to get Thomas Massey on sometime. He was the, the author of that prime act. And, and yeah. I'd like to know like why it never, or like, cause I, I mean, he's not a very popular guy on, on Capitol Hill anyways. And he's, he's very much in the Ron Paul, uh, wing of things where he, <laughs> he's a kind of a doctor. No, he's going to vote no on a lot of shit. Yeah. Uh, but he's a, he's a cattle producer there in, in Kentucky himself. And, and I, I just, I'm curious why that, or it should have been such a no brainer bill that just never even took off. Yeah. I, I don't know. It would be great to get him on and chat about that because that would have been incredibly beneficial for our industry. Yeah. It would have been all these, these, uh, like small mom and pop, uh, guys that a lot of times they're just, they're doing like one or two beef a month. And then, uh, their big season is deer season when they, when they got to make a bunch of jerky. And then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden you're like a year out trying to, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to get a, a, a steer a butchered right now. And it's, well, it's a pain in the ass. And a lot of these guys are ready to, to expand and, but it's just so much money to, to mm -hmm. retrofit everything to, to get to USDA standards. Oh, for uh, sure. yeah. And, and, the, and, and nonsense regulations too. Like yeah, it's not, it's, they're not, they're not for safety measures. It's not for, for food quality. It's 
Yeah. It's to justify their own existence, basically. It's just basically bullshit hoops that they want these guys mm-hmm. to jump through. Um, you know, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And it's really unfortunate, but it goes back to the USDA just, mm-hmm. yeah, being jack wagons. Yep. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's wild. I, there's a, uh, well, you, you said something earlier, like uh, about, following the money who who was uh sunny purdue he was a senator before he he was uh secretary of ag wasn't he i believe down in georgia yeah so georgia's big in the 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 pork industry big in the po- poultry industry uh and big in cotton uh mm-hmm. row crop farming yeah. um i would bet you he got a ton of money from uh from farm bureau Monsanto, all these people that we uh, we were talking about. I bet if you go back through his uh, you know election profile, you know, those would be right up there at the top of his donors. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, touching on Purdue, the American Meat Institute. I bet. I bet they uh, they're in his back pocket quite a bit. Yeah. Exactly. And that showed by his actions while he was in that mm-hmm. position. Um, I, I feel this is unpopular, I'm sure, but I feel like he was a very poor ag secretary. And I'm not saying Bill Sack I don't is- think it's all that unpopular. <laughs> I don't think Good. it's all that unpopular. <laughs> but and I know it's a tough position to be in. I God knows I probably couldn't do it, but my gosh, like it was kind of I felt like it was a good old boys nomination to get him in there. Um Oh yeah, they all are. Yeah. They it's, always are. I I don't know. He was a disappointment. Yeah, I, I think so. And uh, I, I don't know there as far as on the on the forecast, I don't think there's anybody that's going to be better out there anytime soon. So it's like I said, you got to you got to take stuff into your own hands and not mm-hmm. not rely on these jack wagons. Yeah, exactly. Because God knows what they're going to do or what they're going to come up with. Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah. So uh, what's uh, what's the future look like for Mackenzie Johnston? Oh, gosh. Well, that's a good question. Um, So as we talked about earlier, I worked for Tri-State for a while. And then this summer, I did some contract work for the Cowboy Channel and RFD TV. And that came to an end. So right now I'm back full time on our ranch, which I absolutely love. And I just I'm just kind of working as a freelance um, reporter and journalist. But I don't know what's next, really. I would like to do a little bit more with my career as in writing and reporting and something in the industry. You know, I'm super passionate about the cattle industry. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I'm just, I'm kind of just flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, we're so busy here on the ranch with fall work. Um, and the weather's been so great projects and, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but I just, I take it day by day, you know, and if, if an opportunity mm-hmm. comes up, I'll just run with it. And I know what works for me. I know what I want uh, for a career and all that jazz. So we'll just see what comes down the pipe next. I, I'm, I'm assuming uh, Nebraska Cattlemen's will be hearing plenty from you uh, <laughs> in, in the future. I'm just hoping they reach out to me, you know, maybe they'll, they they want to rehire me. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I think it'd be uh, in their... I personally, I think it'd be in there in a, a, a good move on their part, uh, <laughs> acknowledge they were wrong maybe a little bit, but um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath either. No, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I think they would slash my tires if they got the chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it it's a good old boys club, uh, acting like a bunch of mean girls. Yeah, exactly. I just, I don't fit, which I'm actually proud of. I'm glad I don't, you know, fit. I was thinking about this when I was riding pins the other day, um, because, uh, you know, the, like the Lauren Boebert, Ilhan Omar feud was, uh, like trending real big on Twitter. And we have, we're, we're now getting uh, female elected officials that grew up on like bring it on and mean girls. And they're <laughs> acting exactly like bring it on and mean <laughs> girls, <laughs> like bring it on Capitol Hill edition. <laughs> Oh, what a wreck. I mean, we oh, laughed. It's terrible. What a wreck. What? I know I, I know I know people personally that voted for for Lauren Bobert who knows that that she's an idiot, but she was so much better than the alternative that Oh my god. What do you do? 
Yeah, see, and that's the thing. Like we talk about our crappy leadership, but anyone that has half a mind doesn't want to step into that position because they know it's just, Mm -hmm. it's a shit show, which is unfortunate. Right, Right. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I guess... For, for nothing else it's it's entertaining oh <laughs> it's, it's, it's so inter- it's good it's shitty entertainment <laughs> <laughs> yeah they uh I, i've used this quote several times i can't remember who initially said it but they 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 say uh all it takes is hollywood for ugly people and uh it's not wrong it's not wrong <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's pretty spot on yeah um well mackenzie i sure enjoyed it uh where can anybody find your your work i know you're on lonesome lands yeah lonesome lands they have all my articles um i don't have a website or anything i just do everything through uh facebook twitter and youtube so uh you can give me a follow on facebook i almost have five thousand friends and that's where they cap you at so just give me a follow or um give me a follow on Instagram or Twitter. You know, I share everything through all my social media platforms. Right on. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I, I appreciate it. I uh, feel, hold on just a second. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up and um, yeah, thanks for coming on and go follow her, go read her stuff. It's pretty good. And um, move your ass. We're burning daylight. in the morning beneath the star so bright pull your hat down make sure your cinch is tight horse is kind of snuffy cold chill up your spine we'll get your ass moving sun we're burning daylight burning Tell the job's done right.